Hey folks, Uniservo here. Some of you may know that I am on Twitter, Uniservo, and I post various things there. Not a whole lot, uh, but mostly video announcements and pictures of silly stuff I've come across and occasionally a snarky comment. Anyway, one of the people that I follow is Tube Time. He's on Twitter and recently uh, he made a very interesting video about electrolytic capacitors. Now, he, of course, is known for chopping all sorts of electronic components apart, sawing them apart, grinding them apart, whatever, so you can see the internals. Well, he did a rather modern electrolytic uh, capacitor through a hole, but hey, not everything is surface mount. And uh, very interesting. Go check it out. But anyway, it inspired me to dig this weird thing out. This is a mercury capacitor. Now, right off the bat, you can see that, well, uh, it's got a knob. So yes, this is a variable capacitor, but I bet you've never seen one that looks like this. So let's take a quick look at it. Very complex casting. Let's take a look at that knob see transmitting condenser model uc1831 radio corporation of america Faradon. and yes that logo there that is the old old logo from rca they did not use it very long until they switched over to the far more familiar meatball sometimes people call that collectors call that the radio corp logo and down here we can see made by wireless specialty apparatus company boston usa now uh back in the day the early days rca was really just kind of this holding company that uh didn't actually really make anything of their own they basically contracted out and had people make things for them Westinghouse, GE, and uh, Wireless Specialty Apparatus. Uh, it, later on, of course, they became this huge, uh, huge corporation that made just about everything. Long gone, of course, now. But, uh, yes, they, they had other people make their stuff, and Wireless Specialties was one of them. And uh, Wireless Specialties did not last terribly long because eventually... RCA just gobbled them up, and they became part of RCA. In fact, that uh, Faradon, the brand name there, RCA even continued to use that into the 1930s and maybe the 1940s. Anyway, yes, this thing is a capacitor, and it uses mercury. Yes, liquid mercury, that runny silver metal. And, uh, well, you're probably thinking, uh, how? how? How does this work? Because a normal variable capacitor, that, well, they're not used too much anymore, but kind of looks like this. This is a roughly 1940s World War II era variable capacitor. Pretty high voltage. Uh, I think this is only 5 to 30 picofarads. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can kind of pretty much see how it works. You turn the knob, the, uh, the two sets of plates, the area between them changes, thus the capacity. Pretty simple. So what's the deal here? Well, it has mercury in it. And to show you, here, we'll put up to the mic. Let's see if you can hear it. Hopefully you heard that, but the uh, very familiar slosh of something heavy. There is a fair amount of mercury in this drum here. Best I could call it as a drum, I suppose. And you can see a uh, couple of terminals on the back. And yes, thumb screws, because back in the very early days of radio, and I should mention this thing is early. 1922 it actually shows up in the rca catalog called radio enters the home it is in there and yeah it's for sale for like eight or nine bucks too which was a lot of money 100 years ago 
Um, but yes, this is a tuning capacitor for transmitters. Uh, the uh, Radio Enters the Home is actually online. Uh, I believe it's in the public domain now. Fascinating. Uh, just Google for it. And in fact, I think it might be under Google Books. Tons of great pictures and information from those very early days. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's just wonderful. Uh, and there are actually quite a few real copies and reprints, of course, but real vintage copies floating around um, originals uh, because they, they printed an awful lot of them. Anyway, how's this dumb thing work? Well, I'm not entirely certain because I don't want to take it apart because I don't want mer mercury all over the place. Yeah, I mean, there's not much, maybe, uh, I don't know, a few tablespoons, uh, 30 milliliters, I don't know. Not much, but still, that's, that's, I, I don't want it in my lab. Um, but yes, if you rotate this thing, the pool of mercury sticks to the bottom because, of course, it's heavy. Now, the exact mechanism of how this thing works is a little el elusive because I've never seen the innards, but there's mica in here as well, and you, you can see one of the one of the plates, the electrodes to the plate goes in here, nicely insulated. And there's a little mercury fill port right there, which has got some sort of wax in there, it looks like. But I suspect that as you turn this, the uh, mercury acts as, well, one of the plates or contacts to one of the plates and sweeps out. An area. Now, I don't know if the displacement of the mercury is also an issue, but uh, this thing does indeed change capacitance. In fact, let's have some fun. So we'll get that so you can see it. Oop, turn it on. All right. Now, pardon me while I hook this up. Yes, in those old days, thumb screws were very, very common. There wasn't a whole lot of soldering, actually. Uh, screw terminals, thumb terminals, uh, Fonestock clips. Those were the days, that's how you made radios. So let's get this here. Let's get this here. Hopefully you can see everything. No, because there's a lead in the way. There we go. So let's turn this guy. Let's go all the way to the bottom. All right, roughly 120 or uh, uh, 1,200 picofarads. And look at this. As you go to the top, almost like top dead center, about 130 picofarads. And yeah, you can go all the way around here. And this is remarkably close to what uh, the value that this should be. Uh, this is a fairly high voltage capacitor, as you can tell from the uh, from the electrodes there. All right, let's get this out of here. Turn you off. You can see, yeah, quite high voltage. You can see the uh, or insulators, I should really say, on the electrodes. Um, but yeah, the ratings for this are remarkably close to what I just. Uh, I just measured on the Agilent. So, uh, hey, this is still a good device. And it is good for, I think, 4,000 volts. So, yes, for transmitters of the era. There actually was a similar version of this for receivers, and I don't have one of those. Um, in fact, these things in general are extremely hard to find. They almost always have still have the mercury in them. Slosh, slosh, slosh. But, uh... Yeah, now, yeah, these didn't last long. They show up in that 1922 catalog. I think they were out of production by 1924, maybe even 1923. They're very difficult to find today. And, um, well, you gotta, you gotta think, this is just kind of a, a silly idea. Why is it so complicated? You know, let's look at the uh, kind of standard variable capacitor. 
It's a bunch of stamped sheet metal. Some nice cast ceramic parts. You rivet it together. Looks like you have some uh, swaging or something like that going on in there. Cheap to manufacture. Not cheap to manufacture. I mean, look at the casting. It's aluminum. And, uh, you know, several, several aluminum castings, uh, interesting shaped aluminum castings. Oh, and by the way, yes, uh, if you look closely, that pin there, I believe that is a protective spark gap. These were fairly common, uh, protective spark gaps were pretty common in these very early wireless uh, transmitters. Um, yes, I believe that uh, if, you, if you gave it a little too much voltage, they'd rather have you to, to uh, uh, spark there rather than, well, blow up your capacitor. I certainly wouldn't want to blow up one of these things, you know. I'd rather have a reef of blow up than this. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, minor, minor little detail there. And the other thing is, this pretty much has to be mounted on a breadboard or a panel. You can see they, they give you the option, but it has to be upright because that mercury has to pool right, right, right along the bottom. And this guy, well, you can mount this any kind of way you want. There's, there's nothing to, to, to leak, nothing to rattle. It's, you can mount this upside down, right way, sideways, who cares? But nope, this, it pretty much has to be in that orientation. So, yeah, that's probably what killed these things. Now, um, yeah, it's, it's, if any of you guys have one of these capacitors that maybe the mercury has drained out, I'd love to see the internals, because I'm not really certain of how the thing actually works. I believe there are various mica um buffers and stuff like that um and the other thing is what metals did they use because mercury pretty much wants to amalgamate with everything um and well aluminum and mercury when they get together you get something like metal cheese it falls apart quickly so gosh if any of you guys have one of these things that's already opened up and the mercury's leaked out years ago yeah, send a picture or something like that. I'd really like to find out. I do not want to open mine, even though I am noticing there are a couple missing screws there. So I'll have to have to deal with that. So, all right. Interesting device, and I bet you've never seen a capacitor like this. So, uh... Some of you may notice this is the second edition of this video because the first edition that I just published uh, an hour before publishing this one, the video got all corrupted and I went to change it and uh, it, it somehow decided to be landscape and, and portrait depending on which computer you were looking at and the video got, uh, the file got corrupted, blah, blah, blah. And in the meantime, I thought of some more other stuff I wanted to talk about in the video, so I just reshot it. So... I don't know. I'll keep that old video around and just unlist it or something like that. I won't delete it. Maybe I'll... It'll, when I'm rich and famous and you're looking and, and dead and everyone's looking for video, long lost videos, you can find version one of the Mercury Capacitor. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you liked the video and, uh, you know, leave a comment about uh, if you know more about these. Um... Yeah, like I said, they're very difficult to find. I've only ever really seen a few at radio shows. Um, leave a comment. Uh, hey, you know, it's it, I, I think these, these were the only mercury capacitors that were ever really made in any sort of quantity because it was such a dead-end technology. Uh, so, yeah, leave a like, subscribe, ring the bell, all the YouTube things. And, yes, I do have a Patreon account. And the, uh, the details are in the uh, description and such like that. I do have a new patron for, the, uh, for this month. Silent. And uh, another guy, he, uh, he bumped his pledge up a little bit. Thanks a bunch. Thanks a bunch. Every little dollar helps. All right.
So, I'm going to get this thing, uh, do the very minimal amount of editing that I do, and uh, get this uploaded, and I hope it doesn't turn turn lopsided and everything happen. Uh, uh, all right, I'm in a bad mood now. <laughs> okay, I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.